Haverim. Hello, friends. <laughs> I got a smile back there. All right, we'll take it. Have you noticed it's been hot? It has been really hot lately. It's been hot. Have you been hot? It's been hot now. All right, we'll just keep moving. You're supposed to say, how hot was it? Well, it was so hot. <laughs> I was talking with my family this week, and, you know, they have the dairy farm in Ohio. I was talking to my parents, and they had to leave quickly, abruptly. I had to end the phone call. My dad said he had to go feed the cows ice cubes. And I said, you know, why do you have to feed the cows ice cubes? He said, otherwise they give evaporated milk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was so hot this week. Uh -huh. Hey, thank you. <laughs> You're nothing if not teachable. <laughs> so hot this week, we had to change our dog's name, um, our beloved dog, Toby. We've known him as Toby for as long as we've known him, but it just seems like an appropriate time to change his name. Um, so we're not going to call him Hot Dog. Yeah, I know, nobody really likes that, but that's okay, because in six months we're going to change his name. He'll be Chili Dog. <laughs> yeah, I know, okay. <laughs> it's been really hot. It's been so hot that people asked me to preach an extra long sermon today so they didn't have to go back outside. So, <laughs> No, and in reality, if you haven't noticed, we have been in a bit of a heat wave this past week. It's been in the 90s for I don't remember how many days in a row. Um, Friday, I was sitting here working on the sermon, and I just did a little bit of research. I wondered, where is the hottest spot in the United States? And they've been having these heat waves all around the world. Europe is experiencing a heat wave. Here in Stanton, Virginia, there's a heat wave. Where do you think the hottest place was in the United States on Friday? Any guesses? What do you think, Hadley? It's somewhere in Arizona. Exactly. Anybody want to get specific? What do you think, KC? California. California. Phoenix, Arizona had the highest temperature on Friday. 116 degrees on Friday. 116. No, don't feel bad for them. They had a little bit of a break. Today they have a high of only 104 degrees. <laughs> and you know, of course, it's, it's a dry heat. Yeah, Gary, what do you think? Richmond is 103. So really, I will preach as long as you want. or <laughs> You don't have to leave when I am done. It is hot out there. Um, but you know, I thought about 116 degrees. Like That's like getting to the temperature of a crock pot, right? <laughs> We talk about it like being, you know, it's a dry heat. Well, this is like approaching the temperature you would have for a slow cooker. So the people in Phoenix are just slowly being cooked right now. But as I thought about Phoenix, I thought about the name Phoenix. And if you're familiar with Greek mythology, you've probably heard of the Phoenix, the bird. Is this familiar to some of you? You're aware of the Phoenix. So a Phoenix is a large mythological bird with colorful purple wings. And like all creatures, the phoenix gets older and its body begins to deteriorate. I begin to understand this as I experience back issues and things like that. Um, the phoenix is also experiencing these deteriorations. It's getting older. It's failing in a number of physical ways. And it begins to get slower and weaker. But unlike most things, the phoenix doesn't just die when it gets old. The phoenix, as it approaches its own death, bursts into flames and spontaneously combusts. And then the body of the phoenix burns to ashes, and out of the ashes emerges a new chick. You're familiar with the story? Is this new to you? OK, so it's, it's Greek mythology, so it's fictional. So <laughs> don't go out there looking for a phoenix. But out of the ashes of the former phoenix emerges the new bird. So as I was looking at Phoenix this week, I, I wondered why they named the city Phoenix. Is it because it gets so hot there, it feels like it's going to burst into flames like a Phoenix bird? Seems like a possibility to me. But in reality, the story goes that in the late 19th century, so the 1800s, they began to settle this area of Arizona. And someone said this would be a very fertile place if we could just get water here. So they began to use modern forms of irrigation to bring water to Phoenix. And as they began um, living in that place and settling that community, they realized that they were not the first inhabitants of that area. About 400 years earlier, a native tribe known as the Hohokam people 
left that area. So 400 years before it was settled in the modern era. The Hohokam people lived in that area and they left because a river dried up and they could no longer sustain life there. And they seemed to be a prominent and powerful people, the Hohokam. And the people as they came and they resettled the area now known as Phoenix, they said, we want to see this community thrive like it did 400 years ago. We want to see out of the ashes of what once was a great civilization arise this great city. And now today with modern forms of irrigation and of course the gift of God that we know as air conditioning, the city of Phoenix is now, I believe, the fifth largest city in the United States. So that is why it's called Phoenix. Out of the ashes of the former civilization, they wanted to see arise a new and powerful city. So as we transition, I have to do this one. Now again, I'll just be honest, like I don't believe that's a true story about the Phoenix. I don't really believe there was ever a bird that just would not die and burn up and have new life. But there's something about that story that seems familiar to me. There's something about that story that draws me in. And I think that the reason this draws me in because as Christians, we believe in new life coming out of death. We believe in resurrection. Is that true? Am I the only one? Like we talk about resurrection in the church. We talk about new life coming from death, not like reincarnation, but this renewal of life. I believe this is actually foundational for our Christian faith. We believe that even out of something as, as helpless as this burnt up bird, <laughs> new life can come out of it. And what I hope to show you today is that something as dried up, dried up and hopeless as the world around us today, this too can bring new life if God breathes his breath into it. So we're going to look at this passage, and if you feel like you need to burst into song, I guess it's better than bursting into flame, feel free to do that. Uh, we're going to look at this passage from Ezekiel to look at this new life that comes from not the ashes, but them bones, them bones, them dry bones. So we know very little about Ezekiel. We have just a little bit of biographical information that's found in his own work, but much of what we find about Ezekiel is simply found in the first chapter, first verse of Ezekiel's own prophetic book. Now, Ezekiel, we know, was a part of the southern kingdom of Jerusalem, and in, or of Judah, and he lived near, or near the city of Jerusalem. During the Babylonian captivity that began around the year 582 B.C., Ezekiel and his family would have been uprooted from all that they owned and all that they knew and taken off into the country of Babylon. This was a military tactic. You take the people out of their city, you spread them apart, and they cannot uprise against the, the superpower known as Babylon. So this is what we find in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. He says, In my 30th year, in the fourth month on the fifth day, he's getting very specific, while I was among the exiles by the Kebar River, the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. Okay, how old was he? 30 years old. Pretty easy stuff. 30 years old. He is actually in exile at this point, when he first receives his image from God, this vision that he gets of God. Ezekiel is the only prophet that we have record of beginning his role as a prophet while in captivity, while being in exile. The other ones, like Isaiah, they start their vision before the exile period. But here Ezekiel is, he's been uprooted and taken into exile along the Kabar River. And we all know where the Kabar River is, right? No. Well, here's a little map. Ezekiel would have begun down here around the city of Jerusalem. The Babylonians would have come from over here, overtaken Jerusalem, and then taken the people into exile. And for some reason, they go all the way up and around this way about 550 miles over here into Babylon along the Kabar River. Now, you can assume the reason that they went that way is like, why didn't they just go this way? Like, that looks shorter to me. Can you read that from back there? There's a big desert in the way. So he would have been uprooted, taken along these rivers back to the country of Babylon. So it's here as he's along the river 
as he's along this river of Kebar in the country of Babylon, that he begins to receive these visions from God. And the very first vision that Ezekiel has, oh, it's a weird one. <laughs> I have never preached a sermon on Ezekiel chapter 1. Does anybody have this one in mind? You know what this vision is? He sees this wheel. And within this wheel, there's another wheel. And on this wheel, there are a bunch of heads. There's a bunch of flashing lights. And he doesn't tell us what this vision <laughs> means. And we're just kind of left to wonder what's going on here. I have never heard a good explanation of what that vision represents. If you have any idea, I would love to learn from you. <laughs> he just recognizes that something within this is God speaking to him. And I'm thankful that that one never actually finds its way into our lectionary because I don't know what to say about two Ferris wheels going together with heads and flashing lights on them. But today's vision is much different. This is one that makes sense to me. In today's passage, we're told that Ezekiel is given a vision, or maybe he's taken up from this place. We're not exactly sure what happens. He either is taken, plucked up, and transported to this valley, or he's able to see in his mind's eye what's going on. It doesn't really matter if it happens for real or if it's just a vision. What matters is what he sees. So Ezekiel is given this vision, I'll keep calling it a vision, of this valley of bones. Now, the kids were up here talking about bones a little bit ago. Everybody's seen bones. You can walk through the woods, you see the bones. Your dog will chew on the bones. Um, you go out beside, behind Rack'em Smack'em ribs today, look in the dumpster, you're going to find a bunch of rib bones. Um, they're connected to the head bone or something like that. So you get the rib bones, you got the chicken wings, the, 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 the drumsticks, all those things are lying in there. You know, it's not like that kind of bone because these are specific to a species. These are human bones. And it also is very quick to point out that these are not like fresh bones. It's not like you just got the rib bone behind Rack'em Smack'em ribs. These are dry bones. And I sometimes joke about my favorite verse in the Bible being John chapter 11, verse 39. Especially from the King James Version. This is the story of Lazarus. And Jesus is going to heal Lazarus, and he approaches the tomb, and he asks them to roll away the, the stone. And his sister is there, and she petitions to Jesus, you know, don't roll away the stone, because he stinketh. <laughs> He's been in there for four days. His body is starting to rot, and it smells bad. And the King James Version just translates that as he stinketh, and I love that translation. <laughs> but these bones here don't stinketh any longer. It's been so long that they've been dead that these bones have been picked over. Like the, the scavengers, the jackals, the, the, the vultures have come in and picked the, the, the meat right off the bones. The flesh is gone. The marrow is dried as well. And we find out later in this passage that these bones once belonged to an army of Jerusalem. And we know that we have these stories today where we hear about people dying in combat and the people want to give them a proper funeral. You've heard this phrase before? Give the people a proper funeral. But it would have been the practice of the Babylonians whenever they defeat an army, they would just leave the bodies there. Just leave them there to rot as a sign to the rest of the watching world that this is what happens to you if you mess with Babylon. So the people were not given a proper funeral. They were not given a proper burial. They were left there as one more jab, one more poke, one more insult to their injury. The rest of the watching world saw these bones, these bodies, rotting away. They saw the jackals picking at the flesh. They saw the bones drying in the sun. So Ezekiel has this vision. He sees these dry bones there in the desert, in this valley. And God has this message for him. He says to him, Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? Now, don't get tripped up on that title, Son of Man. I know that's a passage or a title that's often given to Jesus. And this is not a reference to him being Jesus. Um, this is just a simple, simply a reference to his mortality. He is a son of man. Um, so he says, Ezekiel, Son of Man, some versions say mortal. Can these bones live? And I love Ezekiel's answer. He's seeing these dry bones are completely desiccated and dry. No marrow, no life, no flesh. And what does Ezekiel say? Sovereign Lord, you alone know. <laughs> like, this is the best non-answer you can give, right? He's not going to commit one way or the other. He's like, I don't know, but you do. Like, he's not going to say no, but you know what? 
ain't going to happen. Like, it's not like it's just four days past this death date, like, like Lazarus, and Jesus could bring him back, to dead, back to, from the dead. No, these things are completely dry, completely dead, no life within them. Ezekiel doesn't want to say, no, there's no possibility you can bring life to this, because he is talking to God here. So he's like, eh, you alone know. And God gives Ezekiel this message. He says, what I want you to do is to prophesy to these bones. Now think about that for a moment. Prophesy to the bones. To prophesy means to take a word from God and give it to someone else. Now, what he's asking him to do is to go to a bunch of dried up dead bones and say, God told me to tell you this. (laughs) Because that's normal. Like, even if somebody just met you on the street and said, God told me to tell you this, like, it's, you're a little, a little skeptical. Well, no, go out and talk to the dead bones, Roger. And then people are really going to say, we're going to take you to the doctor now. So he's, <laughs> or, yep. So Ezekiel is given this message, prophesy to these dead, lifeless bones. Tell them that I will reattach these bones together. The tendons will be reunited. The flesh will return to their bodies, and they will have life once again. Them bones, them bones, they're going to start dancing around. So Ezekiel starts prophesying to the bones because, you know, God told him to do this. And he hears a rattle. He hears some shaking. And these things start to form bodies once again. And God speaks to Ezekiel again. He gives him another message. We find this in verse 9. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Now, I've often mentioned in this setting that there are words in both Hebrew and Greek that have multiple translations. And I often focus on the word for spirit. In the Greek, pneuma means spirit, breath, and wind. And in ruach, the same word, ruach means spirit, breath, and wind. And we can see in just this verse that the word comes up a number of times. And in fact, in this passage, in these 14 verses, the word ruach comes up nine different times. So here God is saying to Ezekiel, he's saying, Tell these bones that I'm going to breathe my holy breath, my holy spirit into these dry, lifeless bones, and then they will have life. So we come back to that question, can these bones live? Well, on their own, no, they're completely dead. They're completely dormant. They're not going to do anything. But with God's holy breath, God's holy spirit, they can have life once again. Nothing is impossible when God breathes his Holy Spirit into it. And the passage goes on to explain just who these bones once belonged to. These people represent the kingdom of Israel. They represent the people who are now in exile, that have been uprooted from their homes, removed from their families, separated from their loved ones and their worshiping community, and spread throughout the kingdom of Babylon. These people that feel like they are lifeless, without energy, without even a reason for existence, God is saying, you feel dead, you feel lifeless, I'm about to do a new thing. I'm going to breathe my holy breath into you. It says in verse 14, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. Now, I mentioned the common lectionary a few minutes ago, whenever I said that or Ezekiel chapter 1 is not in the common lectionary. Usually I preach from the lectionary. It's a way to keep the pastor from just kind of sitting on their hobby horse or their soapbox. Keeps us moving. It breaks up the scripture in a three-year cycle. Today's scripture is not a part of the lectionary for today. I chose this because it just jumped out at me. Um, You might say that it chose me if you want to spiritualize it a bit. This scripture chose me. And the reason that this scripture chose me and I chose it is because I'm tired. I am tired and I get a little frustrated. And I see the world around me and I realize that I'm not the only one. And when I start going up to people, like I, I'm just getting, one of the things I'm tired of is just hearing negativity. And I started going up to people and whenever I greet people, I, I'm trying to change my like, approaching question. You know, you say things to people like, how are you doing? Um, just you don't really expect them to go into stories. Sometimes they do. (laughs) 
and you're, when you're a pastor, you've got to listen to it no matter what. No. <laughs> um, I ask people, how are you doing? Something like that. And sometimes it just comes back like, whoa, I was not expecting that. But I started asking a different question. I'm asking people, what's good in your life? You know, what's new? What's good? What's, what's positive? What's, what's to look forward to? Because so much around us just isn't that. I was talking with Roger a little bit ago when he came in about what we call the Great Resignation. Are you familiar with this term? Where the workforce across the United States, many people are just quitting their jobs. I think for many people that's probably a good thing because some people are realizing maybe we don't need to be so driven toward the almighty dollar all the time. Maybe our family doesn't need two separate full-time incomes to survive. Maybe we can devote more of our time to, to family or caring for the elderly or doing volunteer work or something else. So some of the great resignation, I think, is a positive thing. But the thing that I've come to realize is that so many people are resigning and quitting their jobs because they are just tired, fed up, and ready for something different. And I think of several different um, occupations when I think of the great resignation. One of the first ones that comes to my mind is nurses. Nurses are just tired. And maybe this is relevant to some people here today. Um, Nurses are tired, and I've heard numbers in the last year. um, Where's my numbers? 32% of nurses have considered changing careers because they're just tired. There's this ongoing pandemic. You know, Marlene mentioned that we didn't have church here two weeks ago because there's still COVID in our community. It was specifically in my family. Um, It's not going away. And now we're hearing things about monkeypox, which sounds like a fun disease, but it probably isn't. (laughs) Like, what do you got? I got the monkeypox. Like, all right. I got the Holy Spirit. You got the monkeypox. All right. (laughs) No, like, I joke around a little bit, but but this is, like, nurses are just like, I'm done. Like, people aren't caring for themselves. They're not doing what we need to do to end this. I just want to do something else with my time. The other thing I think about, I think about teachers. You know, as we prepare to go back to school in a couple of weeks, keep your applause to a minimum. As we prepare to go back to school in a couple of weeks in the city, um, realize that many teachers are also in the same boat. The same study found that 55% of teachers are considering leaving their occupation and finding something different, never to return to the classroom again. And the pandemic has just been so difficult on them, going from Zoom to in-person teaching and then back to Zoom again, this yo-yoing back and forth. And we parents, we haven't always been the most helpful in this experience for the teachers. Many people will have these conversations with their teachers, demanding certain things happen in a classroom. We have all these people fighting about things like vaccinations and masks and, and people saying, you know, my kid's not going to go to school if you're going to require that they wear a mask. And other kids are saying, other parents are saying, my kid's not going to go to school if not everybody's wearing a mask. And they always go to the teacher and say this as if the teacher is the one making the decision. They're just the one receiving all of that. So 55% of teachers are saying, you know what? I just want out. And one that's more personal to me is pastors. Pastors are tired. And I like this, this image here. This pastor put himself to sleep as he's preaching. <laughs> I've known a few pastors like that. (laughs) Pastors are tired. I've said to you all before, you're aware of this, I oversee the Southern District as the district minister. That means I oversee six different credentialed leaders right now. And my pastors are tired. My role is that I'm a pastor to them, and I hear them telling these stories. And currently the number that I saw in a March uh, poll said that 42% of pastors are considering leaving the profession and never coming back. As I sat with my six plus pastors and I sat with our, our, our conference recently, I heard that, you know, these numbers are probably way low. If 42% of pastors are saying out loud that they're considering leaving, considering leaving the profession, the other 58% are simply lying or (laughs) are that close to retirement that they're not actually thinking about looking for another job. Pastors are tired. And you think about maybe why are these people leaving or or considering leaving the church or leaving their job as pastors? Here's some of the things that come up time and time again. There is this ongoing pandemic that continues to affect the people in our churches. 
And not only that, we see this increasing political division. At some point, these things like health care and masks and vaccinations, they became very political. And we started dividing over that. And the churches are no, like, no different. People in our churches are fighting. I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the broader church. People are fighting back and forth, mirroring the political divisions in our country. There's an economic downturn, and that means funding for churches is way down. That goes along with the last one, dwindling attendance as well. Many denominations are seeing interdenominational division. You know, at one point, you know, hundreds of years ago, we started these different denominations because we couldn't agree on theology. And now within our denominations, we're seeing these splits where people can't agree on things. And they're saying, well, we have to go start our own denomination. We have to start our own church. And all denominations are seeing this at some level. Our own denomination this year in March, um, MCUSA, made the decision that we were going to remove some language that excluded LGBTQ people from our congregations. And some people celebrated this change. Other people are saying we need to find different affiliation because of this change. And many pastors are saying, I never signed on for this. And even in our own Virginia Mennonite Conference, we have seen struggles here the last year as our executive conference minister was accused of non-sexual misconduct and, had to, or, and was forced to resign. You can see all of these things are mounting. And many people on the outside are looking at the church. And I'm talking again about the institutional church. And they are applauding this because they've wanted to see the church burn down. People are applauding this. They were ready to see the church go away. So I think about these different roles. I think about the healthcare professions. I think about the educators. I think about the, the church itself, the institutional church. And I just have to ask the same question that God asked to Ezekiel when he looked out and saw those dry bones. God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? Now, I don't want to shortchange the experience of the captives in Babylon. This was huge for them. This was life-altering. They had gone through this major national catastrophe where they were uprooted and moved. This was life-changing in every aspect, family, work, and worship. This was a big deal for them. And in that moment, God spoke to them words of hope. He says, I will breathe new life into you. And God didn't say that, you know what, I'm going to make somebody new come and take your place. He said, these, to these dry bones, you will have new life. God didn't say we're going to have babies take your place. No, he said, Israel, you will be restored. It is a renewal of what God had called to be in existence. So I try to apply this to the dry bones that I've experienced in these different areas of life and occupations, and especially the church. And I start to realize that, yes, there are people out there who applaud the fall of the church. There are people that want to see the church disappear and go away forever. People who are ready just to watch it burn. And I want to say to the people who want to see the church burn, I just want to say, be ready, because out of those ashes, new life will New life will rise because what you see and we call the institutional church, maybe that was never what God intended it to be. Maybe there is a reason this needs to burn or needs to die. Because in death, we experience new life. In death, we experience resurrection. Out of the ashes, something new will come. And yes, there are things that probably should die off. There probably are things that need to burn to make space for something new to come and take its place. And I think about the institutional church, and I love the institutional church. I'm in this because I love the church. But maybe we could prune a few things. I'm mixing metaphors. Maybe a few things do need to die and burn off. You, of course, remember in Matthew 28, we call this the Great Commission, when Jesus said to his disciples, go forth to all nations and make denominations. No. Maybe this denominational thing isn't what God ever intended. You remember when God said, go forth and seek political power 
and get everybody to vote a certain way. No, I don't remember that either. Maybe the institutions, maybe the political power, the, the, the grabbing and searching for, for legitimacy within the political sphere, maybe that was never what the church was supposed to be about. Maybe those things need to burn. And out of the ashes, something new can arise. Because you can't kill the church. You can kill institutions. You can kill programs. You can kill political power. But you're not going to kill the church. Because anywhere two or three are gathered, you know what you have? You have the church. Anywhere two or three are gathered to pray, you have the church. Anywhere two or three are gathered to study the scriptures, you have the church. Anywhere the hungry are fed and the clothed are naked in the name of Christ, you know what you have? You have the church. And you can kill the institution, you can burn down the programming, but you are not going to kill the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God dwells in the church, and Jesus said, anywhere two or three gather, there I am as well. So we look out on this thing called the church. And we say, can these bones live? And I would say, yeah, if God is a part of it. And if God breathes his holy breath into the church today, it will survive, no matter how bleak it may look. Because you can't kill the spirit of God. And this church as we know it, not the church, the institution, but the church, the gathering of the people, that is where God has promised to work with humanity. The church is God's chosen method of working with humanity. And I haven't found a replacement for the church yet. This has been what God has called his hands and feet. So until that changes, good luck killing the church. The church will be here. So can these bones live? I believe the answer is yes. And these bones will live. It may look different. There may be reason to mourn, just like the Israelites experienced in Babylon. Things that you have grown to love may change and be altered. But as long as two or three can gather, the church will live on. As God breathed his Holy Spirit into the church, animating even these dead bones, we will continue to worship, to pray, to study, to live, to love God and love our neighbor. Let's pray. God, sometimes it feels like dead bones, dry bones are all around us. It can feel like the whole church is about to go up in flames. The whole church is about to burn. But Lord, out of these ashes, out of the dry bones, whatever it might be, we know that something new and something better is just around the corner. We pray that you help us to be aware of what you are calling us to, who you are calling us to be. And Lord, things may look different, things may change, and indeed they already do look different and have changed. But we know that as long as you are here with us, breathing into this body, that we will have life. Guide us, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this brings us to the time of our service for the sharing of praises and prayer concerns. If you have anything to add to our list, now is a good time to do so.